Hello and welcome to the OpenMRS Community Spotlight. I'm here today with Roger Friedman of Atlanta, Georgia. He is a long, long time senior technical resource in, in several different industries, um, most recently working at the United States Center for Disease Control. We're going to talk to him a little bit about what's going on there. Um, hoping to also speak about a program he worked on called EpiInfo and what he's currently working on with the uh, Health Information Systems team of the Global AIDS Program at the, at the CDC. Um, Roger, before we dig into that, um, how long have you been working in medical informatics? Um, so that, that would be the last 14 years when I've been at CDC. What led you to join uh, the CDC 14 years ago? Uh, because uh, there have, they do substantial amount of object-oriented programming in, uh, early on in the uh, life of uh, object-oriented programming and the other places where I was were not interested in pursuing that. Interesting. Um, so kind of when did you first hear about OpenMRS? When and where? Um, I first heard about OpenMRS when I uh, moved into um, my, my new position with the Global AIDS Program inside CDC. Uh, and um, at, at that time, I'm pretty sure that CDC was a more substantial funder than it is now uh, of OpenMRS. Uh, and it sort of fell, uh, fell to me to be a technical resource to um, both hopefully provide technical support to or technical input to OpenMRS, but um, uh, also to um, uh, advise my boss um, about what things were like at a more nut and bolt level that he was working at. Interesting. For those of us outside the U.S., can you um, talk a little bit about the global mandate of the CDC? Right. Well, the CDC is the, uh, the public health um, institution inside the United States government. Um, uh, most of the health research is done by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, the CDC itself uh, was founded um, back in the 1940s. Um, its an initial concern uh, was with, um, with malaria and yellow fever in the United States. Um, and so it, it, there were, there were people, there were epidemiologists who could not get the attention of, of the authorities as to, um, as to the need for, uh, for spraying and for sort of outreach type actions, uh, rather than treatment type interventions when it came to these diseases. And so that's really the, the core of, um, of where uh, CDC comes from. Um, during the, the, the 50s and 60s, uh, CDC lost its responsibility for direct public health interventions and, and instead began uh, a role of, of strengthening the state's capabilities to operate their public health systems and also to be a central repository and, and collection and standardization point for health information. So the, the CDC has historically provided a lot of, of aid to countries that are experiencing public health emergencies, uh, sending out teams of people to help countries uh, deal with the emergencies and also to do training uh, and establish um, uh, programs uh, in those other countries that integrate with world programs, such as those of WHO. Um, and uh, especially as uh, modern transportation has, has really made it possible for uh, a sneeze one place to be a, 
epidemic in another place the next week, you know, it's become increasingly important that we have a global presence. And there was recently a reorganization here that has pulled all of the global components of CDC, all the major global components, malaria, HIV AIDS, uh, immunization, um, uh, zoonotic diseases, um, the uh, um, refugee health group, um, pulled all the international aspects together into a single center is what we call them here. So that, um, so that there's a, a focused view of what interventions are going into um, uh, which country. For example, um, there was a conference call that got set up inside CDC, I believe it would be last spring. And um, there were like, just to deal with Kenya. And there were like 16 different parts of CDC that were working in Kenya most of whom had never heard of uh, the other groups, uh, many of which were really incredibly small, groups doing IT interventions that were incredibly small and not scalable and still hadn't addressed some of those questions that we've been facing in global AIDS now for, for a number of years. So the move toward a, toward a global a global vision of public health, uh, training and support and networking and uh, surveillance um, is uh, one of the, the really strong pushes that's going on at CDC right now. Thank you. So what is your exact role at the CDC inside of all of these things that are going on? Well, I'm in the Global AIDS program. The Global AIDS program um, currently addresses all uh, United States um, government uh, efforts to support um, uh, HIV care and treatment and prevention. Um, it's really, um, it's a multi-agency program um, run by a, a, a person over in the State Department. It includes the U.S. Agency for International Development. It includes uh, the Armed Forces. It includes the Census Bureau. It includes uh, some of the other parts of Health and Human Services besides CDC, um, um, particularly those that deal with uh, with HIV programs inside the um, the uh, uh, the states. So um, so it's this multiple eight agency program. Uh, in addition, the U.S. provides a lot of funding for the Global Fund Against TB, Malaria, and AIDS, uh, and also has a cooperative agreement with the World Health Organization. Uh, and we work um, fairly strongly uh, with them. Um, I know certainly in our informatics area, uh, we've been quite close to the informatics group at at WHO, um, and um, a lot of a lot of times we're working in implementing guidelines that WHO has has set up. This sounds huge. How many like clinical systems or clinical applications are involved here? Well. Um, I mean, you're right. It's really hard, hard to count. Um, you know, there's probably uh, three or four systems at a minimum in each of the 60 some countries uh, where we're working countries and, and regions. So, um, you know, there's there's hundreds of systems. But again, are they're not our systems and that's that's sort of a question we have to face is like you know we face it once in a while should we be developing systems should we be advocating for particular systems you know um uh should be we be um more forceful in deploying systems or should that be something that's done by the countries or by what we've called implementing partners 
Okay, people like the Partners in Health is an implementing partner in a number of countries. Okay, and very active in OpenMRS, of course. So, um, so at the moment, our policy is that we don't develop and we don't really advocate for any particular program. But what we uh, we do advocate for is interoperability. We try and improve standards by developing things like minimum data sets and by developing communication protocols uh, and by supporting efforts to make different products speak to each other. Uh, the other thing that's, that's sort of relatively new is that um, sort of uh, we've drunk the, the health metrics network Kool-Aid and uh, we really believe that it's important for us not to not to focus on developing vertical systems for dealing with HIV, but for strengthening the capacity of the ministries of health in these countries to identify the components of manage, make work together um, their information systems to have a strategic plan to as to what data they're going to go for and how they're going to go forward and how they're going to gather it and how they're going to transport it and you know all that kind of stuff. So it's um, um, at, at, at the moment um, uh, we're doing primarily work sort of at the Ministry of Health level on um, um, on coming up with strategic plans, helping them implement these strategic plans helping them with evaluating the systems that they have or putting in um, so that they have a, um, a, a good experience base on which, which to build. Are these implementing partners feeding any information back to you to populate a global public health data warehouse of sorts? Um, well, Let's say yes and no. Um, uh, there is a monitoring and evaluation program, which is part of the Global AIDS program. Uh, and that has driven a lot of the need for the aggregate data systems, um, the uh, THISs and the CRISs uh, and the various country information, what have been called country information systems. Um, um, so those are requirements that um, uh, that we put in there, that they'd be able to monitor certain things, okay? But then there's there's other things that are just strengthening. For example, our big effort in Africa with laboratories is to get lab clinical laboratories accredited, okay? And one of the aspects of that is information management. And it doesn't necessarily have to be computerized. It can be paper management, but it's still information management. You still have to analyze it and use it and, you know, take steps to ensure its accuracy and, and review to make sure that it's producing the information that's important to you now. So it's, um, you know, even where we're working at the clinical level, it's sort of less in terms of, of here's how you set it up and run it, okay, but more in terms of is this information, is this the information you really need? Is this information you can act on? Are you using it? Or do the, do the end users have information that they can use in running their clinics? Or is this all information that's going upstairs, you know, that they have no interest in? So, um, so there, there's a lot of activities. On the other hand, you know, we do fund, um, um, implementations in different countries of different systems. Um, during the first five years of PEPFAR, we had what were called track one um, partners, which were generally universities in the states who would actually go out and take responsibility for a geographic area and set up clinics and develop their own monitoring systems and developing their own clinical systems, their own lab systems. Okay, and they would be responsible for feeding the monitoring results back, you know, so, you know, in, I mean, 
we can't do everything from CDC. We have to work with partners. And, and so what we do at CDC is we try and, and, and be strategic to go to places where we can learn things, to do things that we expect will help us deliver our sort of knowledge management services um, in a better way. So you're working with 60 plus partners, I heard you mention. 60 plus countries and 60. multiple partners in each country. How many partners? Oh, uh, I guess if you look at all the programs and all, well, just just if you're looking at the health information systems, um, you know, again, you're probably looking at, at, as I say, three or four systems, maybe two or three partners per country, really more than that. Yeah. You know, but always, always more than one. Um, uh, so, you know, we've got a couple hundred partners. Again, the way things are organized is if the partners work with the field offices. Okay, we have field offices in these countries, um, in most of the countries. And um, the smaller countries don't. This is sort of a historical relic of the way things were funded up till 18 months ago, up to 18 months ago, there was like this core of what were called target countries, primarily in Africa, but also including Thailand and Guyana, um, Haiti, um, uh, that received large infusions of money. Then there was a second level of PEPFAR, which was um, um, funded to a lesser degree and then there was a third level, which were small countries and regions um, that um, uh, that were funded out of the CDC budget. But now all the HIV work is coming through PEPFAR, so all the countries are following the same procedures, and you know. But there's still a big difference, you know. I mean, the Caribbean region that I've worked in has what, like 14 countries in it, okay, um, and gets a minuscule amount of money, a lot of which is eaten up simply getting from island to island. Um, uh, the uh, Central American region is one that I've worked in, has what, eight countries, nine countries, something like that, you know, and uh, 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 hasn't gotten too much money for it. Then there are others that, you know, there's Ghana is a country I'm working with pretty intensely right now. Uh, Ghana's the uh, got a very small office, like three people. Okay, so the way we are in the organizational chart, there's no HIS coordinator for in Ghana. So basically, I'm a virtual HIS coordinator for Ghana. I'm making the contacts inside the Ministry of Health, inside the clinics, inside the the disease program, the HIV program, and trying to address their needs, you know, again, and this is partly because uh, that's really like our base competency, and so we, <laughs> you need to have experience to get competent, um, and this is, this is what I've been trying to do. I've tried to work with um, DS in Ghana and with OpenMRS in Panama to try and really get down to the nitty-gritty of what implementation involves and, you know, management and, and um, uh, what do we call it, um, sustainability. Sustainability is a very big issue um, with, these, with these programs. Can you define PEPFAR for those of us who uh, have oh, heard I'm that sorry. acronym? So, so PEPFAR is the name for this interagency effort. It's the President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief. Okay, so that's the multi-agency program. We're, we're full of initials here, right? We've got OGAC, which is the component of the State Department that one runs the program. Okay, um, and then we've got the the big players in that are USAID and CDC. Hope that's Thank hope you. that's not too jargony, but that's you know that's life in the big city. <laughs> well, yeah. Luckily, I'm uh, I'm close enough to understand what you're talking about, but far enough removed that I can still ask questions. 
you're involved with a lot of countries. How much um, do you get out in the field and travel to these countries? Well, um, so I've been working in Ghana for 18 months. I've probably made five or six trips there. Um, usually uh, two to three weeks. Um, one really long trip of, of, it was like three weeks and then there was the open MRS conference and then another three weeks. Um, you know, so, so, but I'd worked an awful lot with them in the, in Panama. Um, I worked, um, I worked rather intensely for a while. That project got sort of stalled, uh, due to, um, um, issues inside the Panamanian Ministry of Health. Um, you know, it's, uh, we have a lot of, a lot of places where that happens from time to time. Um, so, so the Panama, um, effort is being coordinated out of the Central American office in Guatemala City. And so I've spent, um, uh, oh, probably 12 weeks in Panama and Guatemala, uh, working on that in the past year. Um, in, um, in the Caribbean, uh, I haven't made, well, I made one trip to the Caribbean this year, um, but we managed to have a big meeting here in Atlanta, so I didn't have to travel uh, for that one. Uh, <clears throat> and that was really sort of splitting up the effort between the um, Pan American Health Organization uh, Caribbean region um, and us, because we both have sort of really small funds and and similar similar purposes. Um, so, um, and basically, the main place that I was working with there was Barbados, and Barbados is um, um, is a place where the The Minister of Health has not yet bought into the idea of health information. In Guatemala, um, in that, that's a regional office there, and we're working with, uh, with Panama, the Ministry of Health, and that's where we're working with OpenMRS uh, to do uh, first uh, uh, HIV tracking, but extend it into TB and to antenatal. Hopefully, now that product project's been stalled a little bit due to uh, uh, differences within the Ministry of, of Health. You know, it's it's. I think you have to sort of take a to realize that these countries have very small health budgets. Okay, and. When you come in with a big probe, you can very easily overwhelm uh, their capability to absorb uh, that sort of change um, and, to, and to manage it effectively. Now, that's one of the lessons that we have learned, you know. And uh, uh, for, for example, I was in El Salvador and um, the the guy in charge of the HIV program um, had probably as much money as the rest of epidemiology and and disease directed programs um, combined, and so basically it came to the point where he was um, you know he was he was able to act sort of independently of the of the Minister of Health, uh, because he had all these resources and the Minister of Health didn't have any resources. And that happens in a lot of, a lot of these countries, you know, you end up, you can end up um, ensnared in uh, resource battles 
between different factions within the government uh, as they're all trying to uh, uh, get money for their part of the part of the program. And so, you know, the, the I was in the in the Caribbean, you know, in Barbados is where I've been doing a lot of work in the Caribbean. Now, they have a lot of capability. There are a couple of really sharp programmers there. I've discovered sharp developers everywhere I've been. But the uh, the health minister um, uh, doesn't appreciate the importance of health information, uh, and therefore. Uh, even though they've got an allotment from the World Bank to spend on health information, um, the minister um, uh, isn't isn't willing to put his name on the dotted line, which in a way is good because they're they're really not they haven't internalized their need yet. But the thing is, is that it's a big change for them right now in Barbados, like Barbados has a central hospital and it's got 14 clinics, okay? That's it, that's the health, well, kind of public, a private health system, small private health system. But that's the health system for the island of Barbados, okay? And they've already got a network connecting all of these facilities. Um, but uh, um, they've only got, three people in their IT department, okay? So uh, so wh what can they do, right? And one has to be the manager, right? One has to deal with budget and administration and, you know, all the stuff that managers get to deal with, um, you know? And so, and that leaves like one person who was hired to be a trainer and one person who was hired to deal with infrastructure, okay? So where's anybody who's going to be like the system administrator for something that uh, uh, requires significant attention like OpenMRS does, you know? So there's, we have to try and build that way of thinking and also to build that capacity. And I think, you know, everyone in Africa is asking, just begging for more training to be set up not just in OpenMRS, but in DHIS2 and in all of these, these tools. Um, um, and even that's only part of it, you know? It's like, uh, if, you know, there are various, there have been various decompositions of the job of, of like the chief information officer or the information function of an organization, you know? And they have like, you know, 60 or 70 different tasks that are involved in that. All right, moving on. Um, so with all this travel and all these countries you're involved with, how many languages do you speak? Um, I speak English and Spanish. So I was, there was another guy hired the same day um, who's French. So we were both hired. I was gonna do the Anglophone and the um, and the Spanish speaking countries, and he was going to do the Francophone uh, countries. So, is he still there with the organization? Um, yeah, we're, we're actually sort of a distributed group. He lives in Montreal now, and another member of our group lives in Denver, and then a third member of our group lives in Berlin. Okay, and so um, um, everybody really touches base maybe once every three months if you're lucky you'll have a, a meeting where a majority of the group is there we do a lot of virtual stuff so are these uh u.s citizens living outside the united states um well um uh e yes it's um it's it's a whole lot easier um getting into u.s embassies and doing international travel if you're a U.S. citizen. Um, so, um, so Nicholas, the French guy, uh, got his. Um, well, I think he's still on a on a green card um, um, for you for U.S. But uh, uh, 
at any rate, yeah, the others are, are U.S. people who just are, are living outside of Atlanta. So when you first looked at OpenRMRS for your manager, for your boss, um, what was your response? What did you tell them? Um, well, I have to say that, that, um, that I was really dubious about the, um, the idea of relying on the community to maintain um, a product and to um, uh, implement it in, in the field. Um, you know, I think that that, um, to me, that was, that was very strange. I had some other points that I thought that I could assist open the open MRS with, uh, for example, uh, internationalization um, um, had not taken the steps that it's taken today. Um, of course. And, you know, but I was, uh, the, the idea of the concept library, uh, sort of, you know, the, and the use of that, um, uh, that sort of key value database structure that you end up with, um, uh, down at the bottom there in the ops, um, you know, it, it made a lot of sense. I'd seen that structure before, and it usually, to me, indicated that um, uh, people hadn't quite figured out what they were talking about. So they used a structure that they could stick anything into um, um, when they finally found what it, out what it was that they wanted to talk about. But that, um, that certainly wasn't wasn't the case with OpenMRS because I had had some experience with medical vocabularies and surveillance systems and stuff like that. And it's just so diverse, okay? If you try and, if you were to try and build a medical record system sort of module by module by module, the way you might have done a, another type of system, then you would, um, you would never complete one, let alone complete more than one, because you'd constantly be cycling back and there'd be like impossible demands from different people for different levels of information uh, and things like that. So, um, so it, was a, it was a good technical um, uh, solution. Um, and uh, the thing that worried me was, um, um, how much technology had to be dealt with that was a worry for me and it's still a worry for me um uh, but it's one that that sort of like self-selection within the community is taken care of um i mean we the the open mrs approach is like incredibly clinical that was something that struck me right away it's like everything revolves around the clinic and anything else that you get out of it is you know pure gravy mm -hmm. um and uh but for for us you know we were trying even at that time we were still we were already thinking that we had to improve healthcare delivery systems and information delivery systems you know and it, you know it's one thing to have um, open MRS at Eldoret and maybe half a dozen other uh, centers in Kenya, but how many, how many centers could you run it at? Okay, could you extend it to all of Kenya? Could you, <clears throat> could you manage it centrally? And I think we've seen like with Andy Cantor and Columbia, who and the um, <clears throat> Millennium Villages project that you've seen open MRS <coughs> sort of moving to a more centralized, you know, trying to accommodate itself to a more centralized management structure. 
And now with the like the vast scale up efforts in Rwanda and Malawi, okay, that are that are going on, um, and the need to rebuild Haiti, okay, notice that all of those are places where partners in health are involved and you know they have an incredible skill set with open MRS also. Um, that uh, <clears throat> there's been a lot of changes to it to make it more centralizable, uh, you know. And I mean, the original problem in doing doing uh, information systems in Africa was very low levels of infrastructure, okay. But cell phones have just really moved all over the world, and what what used to be the less de developed world. Okay, so now you've got, you know, 98% cell phone coverage in Ghana, for example. Okay, I know it's less in Mozambique. I'm sure that there's, you know, there's like a upper northwest um, uh, province near Malawi that, you know, it's really hard to get stuff to. I mean, even in Ghana, like they had big rains and and they couldn't get to some villages to, you know, and the villagers couldn't get out because the roads got washed out. Or some places where they have islands in Lake Volto that have communities on them where they're going to get to them by by boat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so there are there are gonna be logistics issues, but is but the information, the growth of the internet has internet has really made uh, made a lot more things possible. Uh, than than it used to be. You can, to the extent that you can centralize the technical needs in operations centers, okay, um, that can serve a wide geographic area, it's a lot more sustainable. Most of the countries in Africa, especially those that have a history of the British um colonial empire um have a very hierarchical system okay so all the information has to flow from the clinic to the sub district from the sub district to the district from the district to the region or province depending on the size okay and then up to the top and no one can send their stuff on until every until it's complete Okay, and no one has any interest in it until it reaches the top. Okay, I mean, it's, and part of that was because of bad communications. Okay, the only way to communicate was that way, pretty much. Um, but now, there, you're not tied to that. And so basically, at the same time that you're providing the data, you can also reduce the number of levels of bureaucracy that it has to go through. You can have senders enter their data directly into the big database, you know, and then that changes the role of the region or the province. It means that the region or the province is there to make, is to look at data quality, okay, or to, um, uh, to, deploy resources in response to the data that they're seeing, right? I mean, it, they become, uh, it, 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 it's a whole new, it's a whole new ball game as for how you organize the delivery of, of, of health services. And, um, you know, that's, that's sort of the other thing that happens is that in the states where we don't have a public, large public medical health sector, okay, what you end up with is you end up with the epidemiology and surveillance being like an add-on, okay, that's only looking at basic, for the most part, summary data, though there is some case surveillance that goes on, but the nationally reportable or state reportable diseases are mostly just counts, and it all has to be added on top of the health delivering system. Well, it's a different story in Africa, right? In places where the Ministry of Health is the main health provider in the country, 
okay, you can extract that surveillance information from the clinical database, okay, and then use the same health information system that you're using to move health service delivery statistics or monitoring and evaluation data, move your epi data and surveillance data through that same platform. Um, and uh, so it means that, you know, that there needs to be a lot of sort of like rethinking the roles and processes uh, in the course of, of doing these things. I guess I've wandered off your question a long way. It was like, what did I think of open MRNs? But no, no, you, you're touching on some key points here and how the architecture relates to the, the business hierarchy. And kind of what I'm wondering is what you see the, the future architecture of, uh, of some of these solutions being. Is it, uh, is it a cloud-based um, service with access through mobile devices? What, I mean, what do you see for the future? The, the clinic level data system is really the hub as I see it, because that's where the information is generated. Now, that's where the information is used, okay? Community health workers are becoming very important, okay? Paraprofessionals and volunteers doing outreach work and, and uh, areas such as uh, antenatal care and uh, HIV care. There's lots of emphasis on visiting. At the moment, and those are places where handheld devices can really contribute, okay? They contribute, and and you've seen this through Open MRS, what the people in Pakistan were doing as far as tracking their community health workers is what they were doing. But things like, like feeding them their work lists, okay? So hopefully you go to a house, you see mom about her impending pregnancy, you see grandpa about his high blood pressure, and you see, check on the kids about their shots and maybe give a little hygiene lesson, okay, while you're, while you're there. And hopefully you'll be able to use your handheld device to have pictures of putting on a condom or, you know, of how to, how to dip water out of a, a water jug rather than, you know, put your hands in it, into it so that the, so that the message comes across with the human touch, but also with a not with a limit to the variability of the message that's delivered um, based on centralized content. So that's going to be important. But the clinical system is not the only system. Okay, there's also like the pharmacy system and the logistics system and the payroll system and the you know, professional development and licensing system, the, the education and training, the, there's lots and lots of other systems out there. So the systems need to be able to interoperate more, okay? And they need to be able to all of them export indicators and work measures and things into a form that contributes to the national health information system okay so that's sort of sort of like my my vision for the clinic is that you'd have a pharmacy system you know you'd have a personnel a node on the personnel system you'd have your clinical system you'd have your lab system um, and uh, the the clinical system inside the clinic and like the lab and the pharmacy and the clinical system should talk to each other in terms in HL7 okay that's a clearly defined standard mm -hmm. so it doesn't matter whose system you put in there they should all speak HL7 for that okay a lot we have big problems with logistics okay stock outs and uh, things like that inefficient purchases on the open market as opposed to purchasing centrally, things like that in all of these countries. So the connection with logistics and procurement system has to, has to be there. Um, the, the 
the personnel systems are generally quite weak, okay? And we need for them to be stronger because we need to be able to see how many people of what skill level are at what locations and what their patient loads are because there's uh, uh, there's in gigantic inequalities of service availability uh, throughout uh, the developing countries. And we're, we're going to be spending a lot of money to educate a lot of new health workers, okay? Um, and it would be nice to know where they are and what they're doing, you know, a year later or to do things like continuing education. So this is um, from this is from a CDC's perspective or more of a country perspective? Well, I mean, the money is coming from Congress, okay? And it doesn't take many bad stories to kill a program in Congress, okay? So it's, it's our job um, as the action arm of the U.S. government for these programs is to m make sure that the money is spent in ways that actually contribute to the reduction of disease. Um, and achieving the goals of the program, um, and and that that's good for everybody inside the country. It's good too. I mean, it's um, it, what you can't measure, you can't really manage. Okay, and I guess that's a truism, you know. But if if you if you go to a lot of these countries. Uh, you'll find that like the capital and maybe the big port city or something like that will have really very advanced facilities and a lot of doctors and, and medical care. And when you get out into the less developed parts of the country, it's like there's, there's n it's not that it's just underdeveloped, it's completely understaffed because people don't want to work there, right? They, they want to work in a nice city and, and have their kids go to, you know, the better schools and things like that. It's very hard to. At, at any rate, the our job is to help the Ministry of Health carry out its functions. OK, um, we, we can't do it for them. They have to do it. Um, and they. But if you can't point out to them these situations, you know, then you know, you can't, can't really have the discussion, can you? Mm -hmm. So at any rate, the, the way this all fits together is that you should be able to extract indicator data from all these systems, bring it into a, a centralized database, and then from that database, the data users would access it, okay? And, um, and there they would be used for all these needs we've talked about for for management for staffing for location of new sites for uh de for development of training programs setting of goals and targets for university programs and you know there's identifying areas where uh where particular diseases uh, are problems um tailoring programs for areas that need them as opposed to a generic program. What could I do to improve these, uh, these interviews more? Um, I think that you should um, throw in more of, of, of your job. I mean, I'm not quite sure what your job is over there with Oracle Health, okay? But, um, uh, but surely some of these things you're hearing, you have, um, you have opinions about uh, or experiences with, you know, um, you know, as to what's significant and what's not. And it's a point of view that, you know, that is, we don't have an open MRS. We don't have like big iron mindsets. And I don't even know if big iron is- uh, That's it. Is the uh, a proper approach for for Oracle? But completely surprised me there. It's something I've tried to compartmentalize. Interesting. But I mean, you 
again, I don't know exactly what your job entails, but if it's in health IT, you know, we all have certain issues in common about how to characterize what it is that we're doing and who we're doing it for and, you know, um, what's the architectural aspects of it, how do they work together. You know, you may have problems of having to, you know, be like a pre-sales person who has to go out there. I don't know what I say, I don't know what you do, but you may have to go out there and give talks to people about, you know, what the vision of health information systems are that will make them buy Oracle as their health information so, solution, okay? But that's just your cross to bear, just like my government paperwork is my, my cross to bear, right? I mean, there's, there's, um, uh, there's a, a nucleus of operative um, concept, concepts and goals and, and design issues that would be good to, I think. So what is it that you do? I, uh, I'm a, my role is called a product manager. I don't interact with customers that often. Um, but what I do do is I, I define a lot of requirements and work with the architects and the engineers to, to develop new products. The uh, product I work most on is a, a data warehouse product, specifically for healthcare organizations, large healthcare organizations. So it's a, the first component is a large horizontal uh, data model that would uh, accept feeds from all of the enterprise applications that, uh, that power uh, a large healthcare network. So it has, uh, I'd say, maybe 5,000 attributes and a few thousand entities. It's a, it's a very large enterprise model. And so I'm getting exposed to uh, uh, quite a, a broad, uh, broad aspects, at least especially American healthcare at this point. And there's a, a lot of uh, data integration issues we're, we're working through too. You know, how much of how much of the the multi-system perspective is relevant to OpenMRS right now? I'm not sure, but uh, interesting feedback nonetheless. Thank you. This has been very nice, very enjoyable talking to you, and I've learned a ton about what's happening in the world: Panama, Barbados, Ghana, Africa, Guatemala. Thank you very much, Roger. That's been my pleasure. 